Revelation. Boy, you know, before too long, we're going to make our way out of Revelation 11 and marching into Revelation 12. Uh, Y'all pray for uh, me this week. Got a busy week coming up. We're going to be traveling to um, a little town just north of, um, of St. Roberts, uh, Missouri, uh, for a three-day Bible conference th there. Uh, it's a church I've not been to before. So looking forward to it. I met the pastor out at Brother Kelly's uh, homecoming back in May. Real nice guy. And uh, Sutton is his name. So looking forward to being with his people. So we're going to be there Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday afternoon. And uh, then we'll drive back. It's only a couple hours away. Uh, we'll drive back Saturday afternoon, get home around Sunday evening sometime, early evening and uh, get ready for the next Sunday, the next day. Um, and we'll have our regular services here, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to hop back in and take a trip down to north central Arkansas, right in the middle of the Ozark Hills. Man, I'm telling you what, it is the country there. No kidding. Last time I was there, I know the pastor, Brother Craig Valines, good man of God. I love him, love him to death. And, um, you know, your version of what is country is relative to where you live. Like, for instance, I would say that because I don't live inside the town of Hillsboro, I live about two and a half, three miles outside of town. So I kind of live out in the country. And we see deer and turkey all the time. And um, last time I went to Brother Craig's church, years and years ago, we like to never found it, uh, GPS don't hardly reach them areas out there. And it's way out there in the country. And uh, we left, Lisa and I left a day early, and we drove all the way out there, and we got off, we had to get off the, the highway, had to get on one of them county roads. And we drove down one of them county roads for about five miles. And then the, the map had us turning down an, another county road, but it was all gravel. We went down this gravel road about three miles. And then that gravel mile cut off and it turned into a dirt road. I mean, dirt just flying everywhere for about another mile and a half. And then we could see his house and his church, but there wasn't hardly any road there. And we had to get out and walk about a quarter of a mile to get to his house. And when I got to his house, it had a big sign on it that said, Gone to the country. Be back tomorrow. Okay, I'll, that was a good one. It's the best I've got today. <laughs> anyway... Revelation 11. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Um, let's pick it up in verse 6. These have power, talking about the two witnesses, have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You know, that's actually part of the, uh, the trumpet judgments. If you remember... Uh, one of the trumpet sounds, an angel comes down and uh, turns a third of the waters uh, into blood. Well, these, these two witnesses have the power to do that, to turn any water into blood, smite the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they will. I mean, these guys are going to represent God's justice and God's judgment, the, the, uh, the fierce side of God. That's who they're, they're representing. Um, verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Verse 8, that's what I have up on the screen, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And if you remember your homework, 
it was to study and read Ezekiel chapter 16. So take a guess where I'm going. Ezekiel 16. Um, if you have not read this, I want to encourage you to read it. This is God. Uh, let me, while you're there in, Eze in Ezekiel 16 or looking for it, there's a verse that just popped into my head. Um, let's see here. How is, where is it? It's, I think it's in Isaiah 1. I probably won't be able to find it. Uh, no, no, no. Well, I can't, I can't find it. But God talks about how the holy city um, has turned into a harlot. I can't, I can't find it. So anyway, we'll go back to Ezekiel 16, and we'll see it. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, uh, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water, to supple thee, thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. In other words, a, a child abandoned. And verse 5, None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out in the open field, into the loathing of thy person, in the day that thou was born. And remember, he's talking about Jerusalem as a city. And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. Thou hast increased in waxing great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee. You know, you're going to see a picture of that. If you read the book of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, it's Boaz who is the redeemer and Ruth goes into him. Uh, he's been winnowing barley uh, all day and into the night and he's tired and he lays down. He goes to sleep there in the, uh, in the barn. And um, when, uh, when Ruth goes into him, she lays herself at his feet. Well, it woke him up and it startled him. And Boaz was like, what are you doing? And she asked that Boaz cover her with his skirt. And so he does. And, um, and that's what God says here in verse 8. Now, and I said, I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. That covenant is... Deuteronomy 28, and it's God telling Jerusalem and the Jews, if you keep all my laws and my statutes and my judgment, uh, then I'll bless you and I'll bless your city and I'll bless your children, I'll bless everything about you, but if you turn away from them and forsake them, then I'm going to put all these plagues upon you. In verse 9, he said, Then washed I thee with water. Um, that is a reference to what Paul said about Christ. Uh, Christ takes his bride, the church, and washes her with the water by his word. So here God does the same thing with Jerusalem. Then washed I thee with water, yea, I th thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. Now, here's what you can do as you're reading this. Number one, you make a primary application to the Jews and Jerusalem being their, their capital city. The, like the home of all Jews is Jerusalem, okay? It's the holy city. And you see the downfall and the decline that comes about with the Jewish people. But, since we just read this verse 9, I washed thee with water, 
And we can reference then what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, uh, that Christ washes the church with the water by His Word. Then let's make a secondary application to, let's say, churches, denominations, uh, certain ministries, church organizations, and so on. And what we're seeing before our very eyes is the moral and doctrinal decline of churches all over this country and all over the world. It's happening in Kenya. It's happening here in America. We can see it more in America because this is where we are. But the decline is happening right in front of our very eyes. Christ washes the church with the water by His Word. But if that church forsakes His Word and it is grown corrupt, then there can be no washing. There can be no purifying. There can be no cleaning, which is what is happening. And you've got uh, churches now that are trying to keep up with the wickedness that is in this world by trying to become relevant to it. And uh, instead of calling things out to be sin, like we're supposed to do, calling out uh, people, calling out uh, different churches, calling out politicians for being sinful and having sinful, corrupt ideas and so on, uh, which is what we're called to do. You know, there was always kings in the Old Testament. Yeah, that's true. But there was also a prophet whom God sent to that king to prophesy and say, I know you're the king, but this is what God said to do. In fact, the king over the Jews was ordered by the law that he's to sit down. The, the priest was supposed to bring him over a big roll of blank paper and an, and an ink horn and a pen and give him a copy of the law that Moses wrote down and say, write you out a copy of this. Why was he making him write out his own copy? Because you'll read it as you write it. And as you write it, you're reading it and you're learning then what God expects out of you as a king and what the law is. And uh, so that was what was supposed to be done. I, I think it's important that we have congressmen that read the Constitution every now and then. Amen? Like the Second Amendment every now and then. Or the First Amendment. We have politicians that literally believe that the Constitution stands in the way of American progress. And the First Amendment is the right to free speech. Okay? The right for me to stay here and say what it is that I'm saying. And I was telling Derek back there, uh, he said, I watched some of your old stuff. I said, well, you better watch it quick because YouTube's snatching them up. They're going all the way back to 2010, 2011, and pulling videos, taking them down because they say I violated their medical malpractice nonsense. Yes, sir. Yeah? I knew it was there. That's it. Yeah. Think of America. How, how America used to be a faithful city. Now she's become a harlot and she's full of murderers. That's true. Amen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of analogies between what Babylon is and uh, what America has become. And uh, there's a teaching I do, uh, Brother Tim, I get that right, Kim, um, that um, I call it Where Dragons Live. And it's based on Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34 that uh, both of those chapters speak of Babylon and it says that God makes it a wilderness so that no man dwells there. And I, I make the analogy of Christ being the man. Uh, that's what Pilate said, behold the man. Um, and when Christ is there, you don't have dragons in your house. You don't have dragons and serpents living in your palaces. But when the man has been removed, 
that removes then the fear that animals have of man and they move in. And what you have is you have a nation where our, our, literally our, um, our judicial halls, our congressional halls, uh, our executive offices, governor or president, uh, they're, full of, uh, they're full of dragons, they're full of, of devils. And these people are basically running uh, America and governing America based upon what these devils tell them to do. That's not a hard thing to, to think about, is it? I mean, that makes sense. And uh, so anyway, when you read this here in Ezekiel 16, think of the condition then of the church or churches and denominations um, uh, right now. He said in verse 10, I clothed thee also with broidered work, shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel in thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Um, for anybody who says that God doesn't want women to wear jewelry, well then... God did something wrong then. Because here he clearly adorns Jerusalem, his, his future bride. He adorns her with all of these uh, jewels and ornaments and bracelets and earrings and everything like that. Verse 13, Thou wast decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk, broidered work, and thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through thy comeliness, or through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, uh, saith the Lord God. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty. Think about that. A church that will get into a 10 or 15 million dollar building program so that they can look pretty to all the people that drive back and forth past that church. Uh, if you get on, if you go down Interstate 44 and get on 65 and head south through Springfield, you're going to see what I'm talking about. The big, huge, massive churches there along uh, 60, yeah, 65 south. There, um, there's a Baptist church, there's an Assembly of God church, and they are massive. They're huge churches. They look good. They look nice. And there's been more than one time that I've driven by there and going, boy, I'd like to have a church like that. That's lusting. That's covetousness. I know what it is. Uh, but I'm happy what I've, with what I got. Amen. Uh, thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and thou playest the harlot because of thy renown, pourest out thy fornications on every one that passed by, his it was. And I can tell you that right now, what the, what the average believing Jew practices is a million years away from, or a million miles away from, the truth of the Bible. They have the Bible, the Torah, they call it, um, but they have added so many loopholes, extra laws. They've added um, uh, all kinds of practices that are not found anywhere in the Scriptures. In fact, they are spoken against by God in Deuteronomy uh, chapter, uh, chapter 18 with those forbidden practices. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're, do, they're using divination. Uh, they're using necromancy. Uh, the Jewish rabbis, historically, in the last 1,500 years, uh, many of these Jewish rabbis will go to the grave of one of their former Jewish sages, they call them. Some, what they call a wise Jewish rabbi, and they go to his grave hoping that his ghost will be there and will enlighten them in the Kabbalah, the mysteries of the Kabbalah, so that they will have understanding, they will have power, and they will be a great teacher. Well, that's done. The Bethel Church in Redding, California does that. It's called grave sucking. 
But it's necromancy. Necro means dead. They're using the dead for their magic and for their powers. And they didn't, the Jews here did not get that from God. They got it from the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Babylonians. In fact, one of their teaching books that the Jews use is called the Babylonian Talmud. And it's things that they learned while they were in uh, bondage for 70 years in Babylon. And they picked up on the uh, religious practices that was going on there. And they incorporated it into their teaching. And no wonder Jesus called them hypocrites. Yeah, you've got the law, but you've worked your way around it so bad, it, you've made it of none effect. Verse 16, And thy garments thou didst take, and deckest thy high places with divers colors, and playest the harlot there upon the like, key, the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. Verse 17, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them and he means that uh, I would say in the uh, religious sense that they have turned their backs to God and they've turned toward these idols and these images that they are now worshiping to and God calls it whoredoms calls it adultery They're, they've fornicated with these things and so on and I mean who knows they may have done it in the flesh too but uh, I won't get into that but anyway um, let's see here Look down in verse 26. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, uh, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd ways. You know, that's bad. When you're so filthy and so bad that you embarrass the Philistines, that's bad. The Philistines were never godly people, neither were the Egyptians. And when you are so filthy that you embarrass the Egyptians and the Philistines, you are filthy. And um, boy, th number one, think of Israel the way it is right now. Um, they are a very adulterous people. They are full of uh, the sin of sodomy. Um, Tel Aviv is like the vacation spot for sodomites. Uh, it is bad. It's filthy. And, you, and what's, what's interesting is that all of their neighbors, the um, Syrians the Lebanese, the Iranians, the Saudis, they all have laws against sodomy, against adultery. They have laws against those things. I'm not saying they don't do it. I'm saying they have laws against them. But Israel as a nation doesn't. That makes them worse than their neighbors. Okay? Now I'm not trying to turn your heart away from Israel. What I'm telling you is, they are pretty much the most sinful of all races of men, and yet God's going to save them. And if God can save them, amen, he can save anybody. Mm -hmm. Verse 28, thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldest not be satisfied. And now think of, uh, think of the 21st century churches in America um, they're not satisfied I mean it it is ground into young pastors that whenever they get a church it is up to them to try to build that church up and increase the numbers and increase the membership and thus increase the amount of money that comes in I mean it's ground into them it's not taught per se, as a class in a Bible college, church growth 101 or whatever, but by the, um, by the testimony or the witness of pastors who they call successful, 
because they took a church that run about 50 and all of a sudden they were running 150 and then they were running 400 and now they're running 800 or they're running 1,000 and those become the heroes and all the young pastors, young guys coming up, they want to be like them and they'll, they'll basically sell their souls, they will sell out their church for the sake of growth, church growth. Everything is about the numbers and getting more people in the pews. And that was what was on me uh, when I first became pastor here was to try to get the numbers built up. I got to get the numbers. I want all of my peers, all of my pastor friends to think I'm really something. And it was ego. I'm telling you, it was my ego that was leading the charge in all of this. And... Um, it got to the point to where I was literally going to play spiritual whoredoms uh, against God and just turning this whole church upside down. And God took a rod after me and whooped me bad, bad whooped me. And um, worse than my mama ever could have, God got me. And uh, I'll... Praise Him for doing that for all of eternity. But think of the churches now that their goal is to get more people in, more people, numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, I remember Noah Hutchings, Southwest Radio Church, uh, telling me years ago he was, uh, he was against the Rick Warren movement, the purpose-driven church, purpose-driven life. Uh, Hutch looked at it and saw it for what it was and uh, he started doing radio programs against it. They, he wrote a book about the purpose-driven church and Rick Warren and so on and he had radio stations that had been running Southwest Radio's programs for years and they were calling uh, and telling him, look, we're going to take you off the air if you keep doing that. And then uh, Several other families worked there at Southwest Radio. They were going there in the Oklahoma City area. The old pastor retired, and so the church voted in this new guy. Are we out? Check one, check one, check one. There we go. And... Um, but anyway, they got a new pastor in, and he immediately started in with going the, the route of Purpose Driven, Rick Warren, and everything like that. And so Hutch had a meeting with the pastor and told him, said, look, you know, I've looked into this, and I understand you, wanna, you want the church to grow, and that's good, but uh, there's a way it should be done, a way it should not be done. And... Um, he sat down with him and laid out his case for why he shouldn't go this direction. And the pastor just kind of leaned across his desk and said, well, it sounds like to me that probably this is not the church that you need to go to. And basically told him to take his people and leave. And I've read, I couldn't point to you what page it's on, but I've read in Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Church book that if it comes down to people in your church that are not willing to go for all these changes that you're bringing in, you just kindly ask them to leave because they're not going to be happy there. And so you put them out. And they make it sound spiritual like, you know, this is really God's will. But basically, and I've said this for years, you know, God said to seek ye out the old paths and walk therein. Well, who knows where the old paths are? Old people. They know, and they're being told by Rick Warren, these pastors being told, these people are probably not going to go along with you changing the service, bringing in a rock and roll band. You're, they're probably not going to go along with that, so you're better off without them. And he said, don't worry about it, because you're going to fill in twice as many people as what leaves your church with this new, fresh congregation that you're going to get it makes all these promises to all these pastors and churches and so on and they're just basically playing the harlot uh, so God says um, 
in verse, look at verse 44. Behold, everyone that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Now when I see that, the first thing I think of is Revelation 17, mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So as the mother is, so is her daughter. So you can tell what church has God's Holy Spirit in them, and I'm going to be preaching on that this morning, the spirit of wisdom. You can tell a church that has God's Spirit in it versus a church that has Babylon's Spirit in it. Once you learn Babylon and learn her ways, when you see it happening in your church, that's Babylon. You got Babylon right there. When you see it happening in your country, that's Babylon. When you see it happening in different places in the world, that's Babylon. And however she is, her daughters are going to be just that way. And think about how true that statement is. You've got a, you've got a, a, a woman who is a godly woman. She fears God. She's full of love. She loves her children, loves her husband, loves the Bible, loves, loves God's people and so on. She seeks to instill that, not force it into them, but instill it into her daughters. And it's no surprise that her daughters turn out exactly that way. But then you turn it upside down. You've got some old Jezebel woman who's uh, left her husband, uh, taken in several men without marriage into her house, into her bed, into where her family, her children are living, which is not a good idea. And then, lo and behold, their daughters at 12, 13 years old are already promiscuous. It's because mama taught them that way. As, let me read that again. As is the mother, so is her daughter. And uh, mama's out there, ladies out there, uh, you will reap what you sow into your children. I'll amen that. I will amen that. Um, now, let me finish reading here before we get the bell rung on us. Verse 45. Thou art thy mother's daughter that, loveth, that loatheth her husband. Boy, I almost read that wrong. Thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children. Um... And our, our uh, cities, our towns, our villages, our neighborhoods are full of women who would much rather get drunk, get high, take meth, or take heroin than they would love their husband or even their own children. How many children born in this country end up in the foster care system because mom loves her drugs, loves her lascivious lifestyle, loves herself more than she loves her husband or loves her children? Melissa, you're the expert here. She sees it every day. Um, our law enforcement people see it every day. They see the women that would rather be high, rather take drugs, rather sleep around than they would be to love a husband and to love their own children. Um, Caleb is the product of that. That's where he came from. Thou art thy, uh, the sister of thy sisters, which loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite, your father was an Amorite, and thine elder uh, sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. So we got Samaria, which is idol worshiping on one side, Sodom on the other side. Verse 47, yet... 
Hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations? But as if that were a little, a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister, of thy sister Sodom. Here's the, here's the sins of Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and the abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. I like to watch, the, you know, since uh, the COVID thing, a lot of these courts started doing their court system online, especially for misdemeanors. And so some of these judges have uh, risen in popularity and fame across America uh, because they are no-nonsense judges and uh, they don't mind helping somebody that wants help and needs help. And I'm in favor of that. But they also don't have a problem with throwing the book at somebody who's violated parole nine times. After you violate parole nine times, you shouldn't be on parole anymore. Amen. Oh, they're not done yet. Um, where was I going with this? Now I lost it. But we have, we have judges that will, that will stand up and they'll, they'll say, to these, uh, say, say to some of these women or some of these men or whatever um, that are out doing drugs all the time and beating up their girlfriends or their boyfriends or whatever, doing all kinds of things, and they'll say, uh, are you working somewhere? No, I don't work. Well, where do you get money from? Oh, I don't know. I just get it. How do you eat? Well, I don't know. So that's your problem. If you had a full-time job working 40 hours digging ditches somewhere, when you got home that day, you'd be too tired to go out and mess around all night long. I'm going, that's not bad. Not bad at all. But that's the sin right there. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. And that's where we're headed, in, not just in this country, but in this world. As artificial intelligence takes over the tasks that you and I are doing now, there will be less and less need for human people to be filling some of the jobs that are now being filled by humans. And it's getting worse. And so they're already talking about a universal basic income so that they will give you $3,000, $4,000 a month every month. You don't have to work. You can go out and enjoy life and let the robots and the AIs do all your work for you. And you can just go out and enjoy life. What are people going to do when they don't have a job to do all day long? They're sit around, make babies, do drugs all day long, get drunk. And beat people up. That's, we've already seen that. That's in the Bible. We've seen it already now. And now we're fixing to turn full blown over into that. But... By the way, with that universal basic income, that sounds like a good idea. Everybody getting $4,000 so they don't have to work. There'll be a string attached to that called the mark. You won't be able to buy. You won't be able to sell. You won't get your money unless you go along with the rules. And the rules will be you get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Whatever that's going to be, that's what you're going to get. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings. Upon your word this morning, we thank you, Lord, for it. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts uh, to your word. Father, use this word to correct us, to challenge us, to straighten us, Father. Uh, Lord, so that we live and we think according to what this book says. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen.